Okay, today is a really big day um, because we talk today about uh, molarity, which is and solutions, which is a critically important uh, topic. So we're really getting into chapter four here. I might go a little fast today. You feel free to you know slow me down by asking questions. All right, so the reason we're going to start off with talking about water is because most solutions that we talk about are going to be composed of things in water. Although we're going to revisit this definition in just a moment. What do we call, first of all, what is what are the two things that make up a solution? The solute and solvent. Yeah, so skipping forward a bit, the solute and the solvent. And water is mostly, most commonly the the solvent. It's the thing that's going to dissolve the solute. So if I say you're using a hydrochloric acid solution, the solute, the thing being dissolved is hydrochloric acid, but the solvent is water. And at least 50% of the mass in virtually all cases is water, if not way more. So whenever we say we have a solution, a water solution, it's mostly that. Now, going back to some stuff from 120, we should remember that water's shape is called bent, okay? Sometimes called V-shaped or angular as well. And water is very unique among virtually all compounds in, the, in its properties for being such a small molecule, but yet uh, being very attracted to one another, which means that water molecules have a very high boiling point for an extremely small molecule. If we go ahead and we look here at the structure, we'll see that, um, oh, this is frustrating, come on. Sorry, let me go jog this guy over a bit. Yeah, there's clearly something broken. Hopefully that'll stay. Okay. So anyway, uh, so we know that the oxygen side is what we call very electronegative. That means it's attracting the electrons to itself. So the oxygen side of water is negative. The hydrogen sides are positive. I hate that two negative thing right there. I, I think that's dumb. I don't know why they put the two thing in there. It's from the textbook. I guess they're trying to show that it's twice as negative as this one. These hydrogens are positive, but it's got this kind of bent shape. And what this allows the water molecules to do is strongly attract each other. The oxygen atom is strongly attracted to the hydrogen atoms of a different water molecule, or actually two different water molecules. Does anyone remember the name of that attraction that water molecules have for each other? Hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. Yeah, very, very good, right? Because the hydrogens are very positive and the oxygens are very negative. We also say that water is very polar. Okay, meaning it has a negative side over here by the oxygen, and it has a positive side, the back side of the molecule, so to speak, here with the hydrogens. And so they're going to be very attracted to one another. And we can indicate that not by writing plus and minus, which will mean something different later when we get into formal charges, but partial charges, which means it's not quite positive one charge and it's not zero charge, it's somewhere in between. We don't worry about the numbers. And that's going to be one of the last topics we'll talk about, the intermolecular forces, including hydrogen bonding. Okay, so as I said, water is very polar, which means it has a separation in its charge, a positive side to the molecule and a negative side. On the other hand, we have a lot of other compounds, uh, for example, oils or gasolines, which are mostly made up of nonpolar compounds, which means the positives and the negatives are not localized in specific parts of a molecule. I can say when I look at this picture, the negative side is on the left, the positive side's on the right. With a nonpolar molecule, I can't say that. I can't say the positive is here and the negative is here. Does anyone remember the name of the attractive force that does hold nonpolar molecules together? 
Anyone remember? It's named after one of the big cities of the world. London, yeah. So the London Dispersion Forces. You've heard of those? They're actually named for London. I'm sure it's some guy named London. But anyway, there we go. And so we find that polar compounds tend to dissolve very well with other polar compounds. And ionic compounds, which are kind of the extreme of this, often dissolve in water. Not all, but often. Nonpolar compounds, on the other hand, oils tend to mix very well with each other. If you tried to put sodium chloride, which is the extreme of polar, into a nonpolar solvent, like gasoline, do you think it would dissolve? Probably not, yeah. No. So that's why we say like dissolves like. So this is just showing this attraction. And this dotted line stands for an intermolecular force of attraction. And it's specifically called a hydrogen bond. Okay. All right, so we've already gone through the solubility list. Oh, that's the other compact, the other uh, note I wanted to make. Um, and that is I put up on the handout section of the website, a solubility chart or a solubility table. So you should use that. I'll go over that in a second. So anything that's being dissolved in water is called the solute. There can be more than one solute, but for right now, let's keep life easy and just say solute, and hopefully there's one. Uh, if the solute is dissolved in water, the water is called the solvent, and then the two parts together make a solution. This could get complicated if you took 50%, let's say I took 100 grams of water and mixed it with 100 grams of ethanol. That's tricky because which one is the solute and which one is the solvent? If you have an equal amount of both, then it's hard to say. But you know, it's it's all how you look at it. But that's not going to be a typical case. And at that point, it's just a silly argument, which is the solute and which is the solvent. Usually I'd say water. Okay. Now with ionic compounds, when you put them in water, first of all, I want to be very clear about two words. Let's say you put something in water and you stir and you only then see one distinct phase. It might be colorless, meaning it looks just like the water before. Like if you put salt in water and you stir, you no longer see the salt, right? Okay. If you put food coloring in water, it changes color, but you don't see any solids or any anything. It all looks the same throughout, right? What kind of a mixture is that if they look the same throughout? A homogeneous, mixture, right? If you put something in water and you no longer see that compound by its own, the word that we used is dissolved. So dissolve is a visual term. If it doesn't dissolve, then that means it is heterogeneous, right? That means there's different parts of the solution look different from each other. If you put sand in water, it's heterogeneous because what's the sand going to do when you put it in water? Yeah, and it's going to go where? To the bottom and just sink there. So the bottom does not look the same as the top. So that means did not dissolve. Some compounds go further, and you cannot visually see this. Some things not only dissolve, they also dissociate. So this happens with ionic compounds. So not only do you not see them anymore as, dis as different, um, but the ions actually break down and separate. So for example, this would have been a salt crystal, sodium chloride, as it's being put into water. The water molecules approach and the positive sides are attracted to the anions. And the negative sides of the water molecules, the oxygen side, are attracted to the, to the cations. Okay. This process will become very important later, and we'll study it thermodynamically. It is called solvation. Notice how many water molecules is, is, is uh, surrounding each cation. Should be six. Yeah. Six is the number here, usually for these. 
Um, and later on, when we start writing about these formulas here, what we find is we kind of make convenient little lies for ourselves about how things are. Let's say, for example, that the sodium is plus. That's really an Na with six water molecules stuck to it. Okay. So these parts have all broken off. So it's going to all look like it's it's only one phase now. So that means it's dissolved based on what you see. But the fact that the ions have separated now means it has dissociated. Thinking way ahead to chapter six, whenever you make new bonds or new attractions, heat is always given off, okay? So if this ionic bonds are so, so strong, how is it possible that all you have to do is drop it in water. You know, I mean, you heat it up to 700 degrees. It's not gonna, those ions aren't gonna go anywhere. But if you just drop it in water, they separate. So what does that mean is happening? What's happening is you're replacing the one form of attraction, right? With new attractions, it's the water molecules are being attracted to this. This involves a whole bunch of concepts that we just aren't gonna go into just yet. But essentially, you're not just breaking the ionic bonds. You're also making all kinds of new attractions, the water molecules here. So that's all you're doing when you're dissociating an ionic compound, is you're trading the ionic bonds that are holding these together for the attractions between water and the cations and the anions. Now, we come across then a very important concept, and that is the concept of electrolytes. When what happens here is happening in water, what we would say about this compound, sodium chloride, after it's broken up, is we would say it's a very strong electrolyte. So an electrolyte is, the definition is it's a solution that conducts electricity. How does it conduct electricity? It needs to have a lot of ions floating in it. So do you agree, according to the way this picture is going, all the ions are going to eventually separate? So we would call this a strong electrolyte. Okay. So it's a compound which largely dissociates rapidly and conducts a current. There are going to be three classes of strong electrolytes. Uh, the strong acids, the strong bases, which we'll get to later. And then going back to my website here, under handouts, under the solubility rules. For us, the most important type of strong electrolyte is this. Anything on this page that says it's soluble is a strong electrolyte. Okay, so for example, anything with nitrate ion is soluble in water. And since it's ionic, that means it also dissociates. It doesn't just dissolve, it dissociates. Anything on this table, because it's all ionic compounds, these also dissolve and dissociate if it says it's soluble. So all of these are strong electrolytes. Anything with group 1A ions or ammonium ions, except for ammonia itself, is a strong electrolyte, okay? So for example, if I said um, potassium sulfate, well, potassium's in group 1A, so it is soluble, so that's gonna give you a strong electrolyte. So that's for us, the most important type of strong electrolyte is soluble ionic compounds, okay? So, so long as you put enough of them in water, it will conduct electricity very, very strongly, okay? Water itself, by the way, does not conduct electricity. Uh, if it looks like it does, that's because it's tap water, which has ions dissolved in it, okay? It's got fluoride for your teeth. It's got chloride in there. It's got some calcium and some sodium and some other things. So that's what's conducting the electricity, not the water. Now, let's say you put a compound into water and it hardly breaks up at all. It makes a few ions. Then that would be called a weak electrolyte. 
For our purposes, weak electrolytes are going to be things that we call weak acids and weak bases a little bit later. And some insoluble ionic compounds. We won't worry too much about those. And then there's many things that can dissolve in water, but don't conduct electricity at all. And those are non-electrolytes. These are the hardest for students to understand. The non-electrolytes, for the most part, are going to be uh, things that only have covalent bonds. No ions at all. So, for example, um, ethanol. Ethanol is a compound containing only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It only has covalent bonds. It does dissolve in water, but since there's no ions in it, it's a non-electrolyte. And this is how these would behave. The ones that are easy to tell apart, of course, are the strong electrolytes and the non-electrolytes. What is a weak one is kind of argu arguable. And usually it means that if you use this conductivity apparatus, it gives a dim bulb versus a strong electrolyte gives a bright bulb and a non-electrolyte gives no bulb. So this just means whatever's here in this beaker has a lot of ions in it. And whatever's in this beaker has almost none. And whatever's in this one has a relatively small number. Does that kind of make sense to everybody, hopefully? So if I ask you strong, weak, or non, the very first question you should always ask yourself is, is this a soluble ionic compound? If it is, then it's a strong electrolyte. If it's an insoluble ionic compound, assume it's a non-electrolyte, okay? Next semester, we'll see some exceptions that cross over into weak. Um, because technically, insoluble ionic compounds are never 100% insoluble. But it could mean that literally for every trillion ions in there, only two separate. So that means almost, that's such a small number that you can't tell. Okay. Now, strong acids are technically covalent compounds, but when you put them in water, they immediately break up into ions, and they do so completely. When I say completely, that means at least if I put 200 molecules in, all 200 of them separate. Nitric acid, for example, if you put 214 molecules, I think, in water, it might be two, it's about 250. For every 250, 249 of them break up. So would you agree that means it pretty much breaks up? All the other acids that I list here are even stronger. So they're in the millions. You put in a million molecules, all but one dissociates. So these are the strong acids. There are only six of them, and you need to know them. The most common ones are hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. And then some less common ones, but still strong, are HBr, HI, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, and what's HClO4? Perchloric. Perchloric, yeah, which we're not going to talk about mostly. Um, it's very hard to deal with because it's also what we call a strong oxidizer. Now, if I give you any other acid, benzoic acid, you've never heard of it, is it a strong or a weak acid? If it's not on this list, it's weak, okay? There, there truthfully are some that are stronger, but any other acid I give you in this class that's not on that list is a weak acid. So if you ever ask me, well, Professor Katrulis, why don't you list the weak acids? It's because it's just process of elimination. If it's not on the strong and it's still named acid, then it is a weak acid. Okay, so let's look at what these guys do in water. So HCl 
aqueous. I'm going to use an equal sign here. It's really H plus ions and chloride ions. Surrounded by water molecules. What about nitric acid? It's what and what? Hydrogen and what? Nitrate, good. And then the most confusing one is going to be sulfuric. What are the two possibilities? H2A. Uh, no, not going. Right. There's two protons, so the big question is, do you lose both or do you lose one? If you only put it in water, it technically only loses one. So what would be left over? Good. And then HSO4 itself is a weak acid, meaning it's going to, some of it is going to break up. This is technically a lie. And as I'm going to tell you this, I think actually I just read an article that says what I'm about to tell you might not even be true, even though I'm correcting myself. Uh, it's really usually written, and in your book, it's written as H3O plus, which is called hydronium ion. What does this mean? It means the H plus, instead of being by itself, it jumps on a, a water molecule, and that gives you H3O plus. It's much easier to write H plus, so I'm just going to write H plus. And in your head, you just have to see it's not really H plus. It's really, yeah. And we don't even think that anymore, according to, as I said, the article I just read um, a few months ago. We really think there's the, it's writing on three water molecules kind of simultaneously, which would be a real pain to try to write down. So it's much easier to write down H plus, okay? But the name of that H3O plus is hydronium. And we'll see it later this chapter. In fact, it might be on the next page. Ah, what did I write? In reality, H pluses do not occur on their own. Instead, they jump on water molecules. The A just stands for the anion. So if it's nitric acid, A is nitrate. If it's hydrochloric acid, A is chloride. Okay. So, but I'm going to write H plus AQ to keep life easy. All right. Strong bases. We got noisy all of a sudden. I heard everybody just flip the page. Okay. They are all these soluble hydroxides, not including um, ammonium, okay? So they are sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, and barium hydroxide, definitely. Some people ignore strontium hydroxide, but it's technically strong. And people will argue about calcium hydroxide. But for my purposes, it's group one plus barium, strontium, and calcium hydroxides. Who is not, who got left at home on this list? Barium, strontium, calcium, magnesium. Magnesium does not belong on this list. No one thinks it does. Okay. So as far as weak electrolytes go, the most important ones are the weak acids and the weak bases. So I already talked about the weak acids. I said there are any acid that is not on the strong list, okay? So oxalic acid, acetic acid, phosphoric acid, uh, hydrosulfuric acid, um, anything that's not on that list, okay? 
And what that means is if it's a weak acid, if you put it into water, the H pluses mostly stay on the molecule. They don't, they don't come away. They don't separate. Okay. Hydrofluoric. So with hydrofluoric is a weak acid. So if I write HFAQ, it is really HFAQ. I mean, let me move that. It's a bad way to put it, for example. So it is much more HF than H plus plus F minus. That's all I'm saying. So if I looked at the molecules in the water, the H and the F are still together. For about every, I want to say it's about every 200 or so, one of those will break up. So will it conduct an electricity? Slightly. That's why it's called weak. Because there's very few ions, but there's enough, just enough that it'll conduct electricity. And we're not going to try to give a number for what just enough means, OK? As far as weak bases, they are very difficult to describe at this point. Uh, but we'll just say right now ammonia is the only real important weak base that you need to know at this point. Okay. The non-electrolytes, as I said, are ionic are non-ionic compounds uh, that do dissolve, or they're going to be ionic compounds that do not dissolve. Okay. Essentially, it's anything that doesn't make ions in water. So if we look at some examples, ethanol isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, glucose, and sucrose. What do we notice is, in, is common about all of these? Carbon, yeah, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and none of them are, are so they're all going to be held together by covalent bonds, okay? Now, if I said acetic acid, that also has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but it is a acid. It will have an H listed first in the formula, and it is a weak acid because it's not on the list of strongs. All right, so this all leads us to the most important part of today, which is going to be concentration and molarity. By the way, I know it's flickering. They're supposed to come in and fix this. So hopefully very, very soon. I'll try moving this, see if that fixes things a bit. But it's it's just something to do with that port. Okay. So concentration is essentially the amount of solute in a given amount of solution. And there are many ways of expressing concentration. In chemistry, by far the most important is something called molarity. And we're going to spend a lot of time on it right now. There are other things, like in chapter 11, we'll talk about molality. Uh, there's parts per million. There's percent. All of those are types of concentration units. But we really want to be very critically important here with molarity. So molarity, which we often abbreviate as M, and that's sometimes dangerous, you must always understand, even if it's an M, it stands for two units. It's a ratio. Moles of solute for every one liter of solution. That's how we should read that. So to find it, you use this formula. But after you've calculated it, it is moles of solute for every one liter of solution. So let me write that down in words, for example. OK? So example. In words, six molar HCl means six point zero moles of HCl 
or every one liter of HCL solution, of that HCL solution. I will usually abbreviate that as just solution, unless we, or as just HCL, one liter of HCL. But please understand that if I write for every one liter of HCL, I really mean not pure HCL, HCL solution. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at how this is done, by the way. So the way we usually make a solution is if we have a solid solute, what we do is we weigh out the amount that we want to put into here. And this is called a volumetric flask. It's only designed to measure one volume, but it measures it extremely accurately. So let's say that this is a one liter volumetric flask. That means that when you fill it completely to water with water to that line, it's going to be 1.000 liters, okay? It's very accurate, 1.003, uh, 1.000 liters, okay? Uh, this is not actually how I would do it. I would take the solute, put it in a beaker, add enough water to get it to dissolve, pour it over, and then you shake it and shake it and shake it, and then you add enough water until you get it just right to that line. Let's say that this is one mole of sodium dichromate. If this is one mole of sodium dichromate, how would I figure that out, by the way? I would have to know its molar mass. I would weigh it out. So I would weigh it out very, very accurately. And if this is one liter, then I have one mole for every one liter. Good. So it's one molar. Let's say this is 0 0.80 moles. Then this would be 0 0.80 M. Yeah, molar. Good. Never forget the M is two units, moles per liter. All right, what is the molarity of the solution formed by dissolving 150 grams of potassium hydroxide in enough water to make 2.500 liters of solution? So I'm given grams. If I want molarity, I need to convert that to moles, right? So that's the first thing I need to do. So let's find moles of KOH. So I have 150 grams. Uh, potassium, 39.1, I think. Yeah, 39.1. Plus 16 for oxygen, plus 1.008 for hydrogen. So this is 56.11 grams per mole. Is that what you guys got? Good. And so that's what, 150 divided by that? 2.67. Or six dicks, right? So then the find the molarity. It would be that number. Oops. Two point six seven three four. moles of the solute, potassium hydroxide. Remember, I've only got four sig dicks, hence the line. And the volume wasn't one liter, it was 2.500 liters of the solution, right? 
So moles over liters gives you molarity, 1.069. which instead of writing it out this long, tedious way, we would usually just write 1.069 molar. And that's how we read the M, molar KOH. Okay, now I worded this in a way that looks intentionally awkward. I said I took 150 grams of KOH and I added it in enough water to make 2.500 liters of solution. I did not word it. I took 150 grams and dissolved it in 2.500 liters of water. I did not say that. And the reason for that is I'm never actually measuring how much water I'm adding. The only thing I know at the end is the final volume of everything together because the solute might take up space and add to the volume. Sometimes it will actually do the opposite. It will, the ions will pull the water molecules even closer, so you'll need more than a liter. So I don't know how much water I added. I will tell you this, it's gonna be close to a liter, but it could have been anywhere from about 0 0.990 liters to 1.01 .01 liters. I really don't know. So that's why I never say dissolved in one liter. I say dissolved in enough water to make one liter. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully, good. So let's say I wanted to make 750 mLs of a 1.500 molar sodium chloride solution. What mass of sodium chloride is needed? It's a critically important type of a question. Again, you would never begin with molarity because it's a intensive property. It's one of those ratios. So what does this say again? For every, there are 1.500 moles of sodium chloride for every every one liter, but I'm not giving you a liter, I'm giving you 750 milliliters. Good. So we're gonna need a conversion here. So I've got 750 milliliters of, there's only one solution in this problem, right? So I'm just gonna write milliliters of solution. Now I need to get that to liters. So how many milliliters in a liter? That's a number that should be memorized. Thousand. Now, what do we do? We're trying to get to grams of sodium chloride. So to get to grams, I need to go through moles and I'm going to use the molarity. So what needs to go in the denominator here? Yeah, for every one liter of solution, there is what is this saying? Yeah, 1.500 moles of the solute. And what's the solute in this problem? And I see, yeah, good. And finally, a mole of NaCl has a mass of 58.44 grams. Does every step make sense? First, I said, well, I need the volume to be in liters. 
Then for every liter of solution, I need a mole of sodium chloride. And then every mole of sodium chloride needs 58.44 grams. So I went to grams through there. Okay, so now, by the way, I would not have done the question this way. I would have not written 750. I would have just started by converting it myself. What is 750 mLs? To convert to liters, you just move the decimal three to the left. And you don't drop any of these trailing zeros because they are significant. Oops, excuse me. After a while, I'm just going to start doing that. I'm going to just start dropping the first step because to convert milliliters to liters, you just move decimal three to the left. Good. In fact, that's how I'm putting it in the calculator. 0. 0.750 times 1.5 times 58.44. And I'm coming up with 65. I've got four sig 65.75. So I think as we can see in this problem, the molarity now gives you a way to get at moles from volume of a solution, okay? How did we get from volume of a pure substance to moles? Volume of a pure liquid. You needed two steps, what were they? to get from volume of a pure liquid to moles. You need the density. So the density would take you from the volume of the pure liquid to the grams of the pure liquid. And then once you know grams, you need the molar mass to find the moles. This is a solution. We don't know, we don't have the pure substance. We don't have pure salt here, right? All the salt is surrounded by water. So, this lets you go from volume, either liters or milliliters, to moles directly without needing grams. Okay. And that's what we did here is we got to moles. I just happened to ask how many grams is that? So I could have asked how many moles is that and you would have stopped right here, right? Good. How many moles, this time is a how many moles questions are there? Are there in 35 milliliters of a sodium so as nitrate solution, how many grams? So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna do the same question, but break it into two parts. This time I'm gonna simplify this. Now, a lot of people will mess up here. How many liters is that? Yes. A lot of people will write 0.35. I'd say a, a quarter of people on an exam will say 0.35. Remember, you have to move the decimal three to the left. So if, if it's less than 100, it's going to be 0, 0.0 something. If you're not sure that you can do that without making a mistake, then don't leave out the conversion. Okay, I just did it in my head. Okay, so very, very similar to the last question. Except we're going to do it in two parts. If you don't mind, I'm going to do it in a kind of a weird way. I'm going to start off. Actually, no, I'm not going to do it in a weird way. 0 0.3500 liters. I just don't need a line that's long, too long. So liters of the solution, since there's only one solution, I'll just write solution. If there's two solutions in the problem, I would have written the formulas instead, so I don't confuse them. Okay, and what is this saying here? Exactly, for every one liter of this, there's 0.9375 moles. Make sure you don't get that backwards. For every one liter of the solution, there are 0 
moles of what? What's the solute? Sodium nitrate. So if I stop here, that would tell me how many moles. Okay. And so what do I get? 0 0.035 times 0.9375 is uh, 0 0.03281 moles. And then how do we convert that to grams? Yeah, we're just going to use the molar mass. So using that same number, 0 0.03281 moles of sodium nitrate. Um, I don't know that one, so let me look it up. Sodium is 22.99. Hydrogen is, what's that? 85. 85. Um, yep, 85.00, right? So every one mole of sodium nitrate. Eighty five grams. Again, in reality, I'm using this number on. Oh, I guess I did round it off. Shoot. Oh, well. Point zero three two eight one. So I'm getting two point seven eight nine. Did you guys get it? Good. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Now, sometimes um, you're not going to be interested in the ionic compound because the ionic compound isn't really what's in there, right? There isn't really sodium nitrate in the solution. It's really what? It's a strong electrolyte, so there's not sodium nitrate. There's sodium ions and nitrate ions which are surrounded now by water. They mostly abandoned their partners, okay? Now, the molarity of most ions is simply the molarity of the solvent, I mean, of the solution, if everything is one-to-one, -one, but that's not always the case. For example, let's say I have a 0 0.10 molar aluminum chloride solution. Assuming everything breaks up, and this is not actually true, but assuming it does. What is this really? Assuming everything dissociates, there is really one aluminum ion floating in the water, and there is really three chloride ions all floating in the water. And this is even not really true. What's really true is that aluminum is surrounded by uh, how many probably? Six, yeah. Now you agree it's much easier to write that than to write the complex ion formula, which I don't want you to write right now, but later on we'll start writing it like this. This is what's called a complex ion. You agree that's a pain to write that whole thing, okay? You just need to remember, if this is in water, it's surrounded by water. And later on, it gets important to know that there's probably gonna be six, sometimes four, it depends on the ion. Um, but that's not something you would need to know for this semester. So just know the water loves 
that, especially when this number is two or greater. Okay. So the molarity of aluminum chloride and aluminum are going to be the same because why? Well, for every one aluminum chloride, you're getting how many aluminums? One. So if I say I have 0 0.10 molar aluminum chloride, every one mole of aluminum chloride gives me a mole of aluminum, so their molarities are the same. Oh, it's 0 0.10 times one. It's always times whatever this number is in front of the number of ions, or better yet, whatever this number is in the formula, one aluminum. On the other hand, chlorides, this is going to give me three chlorides, and so therefore, it would be three times as much, right? Just like people, right? In terms of concentrations, for every one person, I have 10 fingers, if we count thumbs as fingers, right? For every one person, I have two eyes. Same idea here, you know, although an eye is not a person, obviously. And a chloride ion isn't an aluminum chloride, but it splits into parts. Okay, so let's find the concentration of these ions. A is very easy. Because if I've got potassium hydroxide, what are the ions in potassium hydroxide? Potassium and hydroxide, right? Yeah. And there's how many potassiums? For every one potassium hydroxide, there is one potassium and one hydroxide. So whenever there's a one in front of these, or there's one of each ion, the molarity of the ion is the same as the molarity of the solute uh, as given. So in other words, and this is how we write this. This shortcut means molarity, okay? Or actually, yeah, it could mean concentration. We usually use it around ions, but sometimes people will write it around compounds too. So the molarity of, of potassium is what? It is one times the 0 0.945 molar, which is yeah, 0 0.945 molar. And hydroxide is the same thing, right? It's one times 0 0.945. Would you really ever need to write one times? No. I'm just putting it there so you know when you compare to the next question why there aren't ones there. This is wrong. This should be KOBAOH2. I don't know why the two is way up there. So barium hydroxide is a strong electrolyte. It completely splits up. So that means this is going to give you one barium. Very good. So the barium concentration, because a barium has a one in front of it, that means there's going to be the same molarity as the barium hydroxide. But the hydroxide is going to be two times 0 0.015 molar, which is 0 0.030 molar.
Okay. Now, sometimes we can do these additively. So let's say that for a moment, you took 10 milliliters of the first solution in A, and you add it to 190 mLs of the second solution. I wanna know what the molarity of hydroxide is in that final solution. Since there's hydroxide in both of them, they would add up, right? You cannot add molarities. But what can you add? But you can add the moles of hydroxide in this case. So how am I gonna do this? I want you to think about this. I'm taking 10 milliliters of A plus 190 milliliters of B and I wanna find the molarity of the new third solution, C, let's call it. Just the hydroxide, I don't care about the barium or the potassium. How could I do that? If you can't add molarities, but you can add moles, what are you gonna do? Find what? Yeah, very good. So you find the moles in each of them and then add them together and then divide by the? the total volume, which is going to be 200 mLs, right? Because you took 10 mLs plus 190 mLs. Good. So let's start with uh, moles of hydroxide from, from the potassium hydroxide. How are we going to do that? How are we going to find... We've got 10 milliliters of the first solution. Uh, no, don't eat that. Yeah, just use the molarity. So, but first I'm gonna convert milliliters to liters. What would that be as liters? 0 0.0120s, right? Zero, 00 liters of the KOH solution. And for every one liter of the KOH solution, there is how much hydroxide? Point nine four five, right? Moles of I'm gonna use this molarity over here on the right, the moles of the hydroxide, right? You should be able to do that in your head. So times 0 0.01 means I'm gonna move the decimal two to the left. Now, normally I would use scientific notation, but I think this problem will be easier if I leave it out of scientific notation. And now I need moles from the barium hydroxide. So how am I going to do that? Good, 0 0.1900. That's the 190 milliliters, right? Of the barium hydroxide. And according to the problem, for every one liter of this, for every one mole of this, or one liter of this, there's 0 .3, 0 0.3 moles, okay?
So that one I cannot do in my head. 0.19, I should be able to. 0.33. What's that? 0 0.38, 0 0.5, something like Yeah. So that's going to be 0 0.00. Five seven. Did I drop a sig dick? No. Only two sig dicks. Once they've been added to the water, can you tell the difference from whether a hydroxide came from sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide? Or no, a hydroxide is a hydroxide is a hydroxide. Okay. And so what is the total? I'm getting 0 0.0152, yeah. So that's how many moles of hydroxide there are. How do I find the molarity? I need the total volume, which is, yeah, because exactly, there's 10 mLs of the one solution plus 190. Volumes are not always additive, by the way. But if these are both water solutions, then they should be. So this is 200 mLs, which is 0 0.2000 liters. So the molarity of hydroxide is 0 0.0152 moles over 0. 2000 liters again i'm not rounding numbers so i'm getting 0 0.0758 okay one second Thank you. That lasts for about a minute and a half. Any questions about this? Does it make sense to everybody, right? Good, so this is where you're mixing moles from one problem to another. Now, technically, whenever you are taking solutions and combining them like that, especially if you had added water, but even when you're combining similar solutions, what you're actually doing is a process called dilution. And so that's the next big focus here. Many chemicals that we get, that we get are much more concentrated than we need. And the reason for that is because, for example, hydrochloric acid, today I didn't need 12 molar in the lab, I needed six molar. So why would I buy 12? The issue is you're always going to be able to provide water right? We always have water. So we can always lower the molarities by adding our own water. That's called diluting. It's the same idea with, would you rather buy a box of dish of uh, laundry detergent that's this big that does 100 loads or one that's this big that does 100 loads? If they still only do 100 loads, it's easier to get the smaller one because your washing machine will provide the water. Right? You don't need to worry about that. 
And so this is a, a really major, major topic for us in chemistry, and that is that we're very frequently diluting solutions. So whenever you combine something with water, its molarity will, or concentration will always go down, okay? Now, it turns out that we can find the new concentration by using a similar process to what we did like here, where you find the molarities, you find the moles and then divide by the total volume. But there is a simpler process that can be carried out. And that is just by using uh, what we're gonna call the dilution equation. And the dilution equation is basically saying the starting molarity times the starting volume of a solution is going to equal the final molarity times the final volume. This would also work for other things too, like percent compositions and some, I mean, some compositions and things. So the ones just represent the starting values, the two representing the ending values. What is the key point about this? What is molarity times volume? So let's say we had mole molarity times liters. What unit would that be? What? Yeah. Moles, good. And then what would this unit be? So what is this saying? It's saying that the moles before you add the water is still going to be the same after you add the water. Because if you're only adding water, you're not increasing the number of moles of solid. So that's really what this equation is saying. You're, you're starting with the same number of moles as you're ending with. The only thing that's changing around is the molarity and the volume. So their products must always stay the same. Okay, come back. Very good. Okay, thank you. Now in diluting, there's several ways that we can do this. There's lots of pieces of equipment that you can use. This piece of equipment right here on the left, under right over the letter A, is called a graduated pipette. It's a lot like a small graduated cylinder. It's good for measuring out very specific volumes with very good accuracy. Over here is a on, under B is what is called a volumetric pipette. It only allows you to measure one volume, but it gives you superior accuracy. Now, if you wanna measure out one milliliter or two milliliters or five milliliters or 10 milliliters or 20 milliliters, a nice whole number like that, you can probably buy a volumetric pipette that does that. If you try to get 4.52 milliliters, that probably doesn't exist. You can't buy one of those. So you'd have to use a graduated, okay? Uh, so they're gonna have their own different purposes and they work a little bit differently. The way we dilute is very simple. You get the solution that was up here. This came from what you called your stock solution. So this solution was already ready to go. You add it to some water, and then you add more water until it comes up to the line. And now we say we have a diluted solution. Notice again, we're never really measuring how much water we're adding. Well, we could, but... A different process. Okay. So, vitally important when, it, first of all, this is not a chemical reaction. So, there's not a, a reaction that you have to, to, to write out because what are you doing? You're taking something in water and just adding more water, right? If it was going to react with water, it already would have reacted with the water by that point in time. You're just adding more solvent. You also need to be very careful the way you read these questions, because I can ask them two different ways that mean two different things. If I say it's diluted to a final volume or a volume of blah, 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 then that means I've given you V2. I've given you the final volume. So if I say I take 10 mLs and dilute it to 500 milliliters, 500 milliliters is V2. What if I say I take 10 milliliters and I add 300 mLs to it? The final volume is not 300 milliliters, it is 310, yeah. So you have to read the wording carefully, okay. So a chemist measures out 25 milliliters of concentrated acetic acid and dilutes it to a volume of one liter. So that means that is the final volume. 
Determine the molarity of the final solution, both with and without using the dilution equation. So let's use the dilution equation first. So let's see what we know. Do we know the starting molarity? Yeah. 17.4. Do we know the starting volume? It is 25 milliliters. Now, by the way, you can do everything in liters or in milliliters. It's going to be your choice. But you have to pick one. Because if I give you volumes, um, you can pick either one. So let's keep it in milliliters for right now. Do I know the final molarity? We don't know it. It's the unknown, right? And what is the final volume? It's one liter or better yet, 1,000. So I got to be very careful with three sig digs. Milliliters. Good. Okay, so we're going to do some algebra. M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Who do we want by itself? M2, right? So you're going to divide both sides by V2, and you will get M2 equals... M1 times V1 over V2. Correct? Good. It's always better to do your algebra in letters first before you stick numbers in. You're less likely to make rounding errors or errors in general. So what was M1? 17.4 molar. V1 was... 25 milliliters, V2 is 1,000 milliliters. Notice, please, again, if you're increasing the volume, the molarity must go down, yeah. So clearly multiplying 17.4 by 25 over 1,000 makes it go down. So 17.4 times 25 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.435. Uh, notice, yes, I am using milliliters, but what happens to them? They cancel. So you're left with units of molarity. And you agree the molarity went down. The other way to do it, and I used to only like it this way, but for some reason I just changed my mind and decided to get rid of it. Um, but the other way to do this is to say, well, molarity is moles over liters, right? So let's find the moles of the acid. And how could I do that? I started with 25 milliliters, correct? Which is 0 0.025, 0, 0 liters of the acetic acid. And the starting molarity was, yeah, for every one liter of acid, there is 17.4 moles of Acetic acid, yeah. I mean, normally I wouldn't write just acid, but it's clear from the problem. So 0 0.025, 0, 0 times 17.4, 0 0.435. 
moles of the acid. And then the molarity would be this divided by the, the volume yet. Yeah, remember, that's not the answer, that's moles. Now, it just so happens that the final volume is one liter. So 0 0.435 moles of the acid divided by 1.00 liters. But we know if it's a one in the denominator, do you even have to put it in your calculator? No. So it'll just come out as 0 0.435 molar. Which way is easier? I think most people find A to be easier. <laughs>